you now in the name of your blessed holy son our lord jesus we worship you father son and holy spirit lord in your presence is fullness of life and as you said your house is a house of prayer but before you lord are holy angels the redeemed of the lord who just constantly pour out worship and praise and adoration of you and we ask you to now come in your presence, Lord, your holy manifest presence, Holy Spirit, come and move in our midst, in our hearts. We ask and I ask, Lord, for a deeper move of your spirit in our lives and a spirit of prayer upon us personally and upon your church here and your church in the United States. Oh, good Lord, we pray come. As we come today to this time, we pray that you would move in our lives and hearts just to stir our hearts with the greater holy desire to pray. And we do pray, Lord, and bind the power of the enemy as we realize he is the enemy of you and prayer. And so come, Holy Spirit, be free to move among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and I've asked Jim, Pam's going to be handing out, ask Jim to pray for revival as we're praying every Sunday. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> Individually, the church, the city, the city, the city, the city, the yes, city, Lord. The Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, Pam, for getting those handouts. All right. And today, now, of course, uh, we're continuing the uh, series uh, entitled Lord Teach Us to Pray, which is based upon Luke 11, 1. And I, as we saw last week, this is the only request that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to do. And he could have been anything, teach us how to do miracles, teach us how to teach, teach us how to interpret the Bible. But their one desire is to learn how to pray. And so today we're going to focus specifically on what I'm calling a holy desire for prayer. Now, all of us who are following the Lord Jesus Christ and being transformed in our hearts into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ will have a holy desire for prayer, to seek God and to pray. Now, this is because the fundamental purpose of God to bring about his will is through prayer. And you'll be hearing what I'm uh, constantly going to be reminding us of through this series, that while God can do anything, he freely chooses to do. He is sovereignly chosen to accomplish his purposes, fulfill his plans, and manifest his power through prayer. And so that, again, if we want God's will done in our lives, we will be people of prayer. Now, the Bible reveals there are two primary powers working in us. There's us, we have our mind, our soul, and of course, in our body. But, you know, there's us with our own personal desires, but there's two other powers working within us, all right? The power of the flesh and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 say, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against, the Greek word is kata which means opposed, it's against, it's alienated against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, the flesh, I think perhaps most of us are familiar with that, but it's simply the reality of human nature and specifically infused with, infected by the spiritual disease of sin. That's fundamentally in our hearts and comes through our minds and our wills so that then we act according to the desire of the fallen sinful nature or sin. Now, I'm going to be technical here, um, and it's just simply phraseology. But, you know, most of the time we're praying, you know, less of me, more of Jesus. Okay. And the reason I'm being technical is because Really what Jesus wants is more of himself in you. But it's the power of sin in us 
that turns us away from the reality of who Christ is in us. So when we say less of me, what we're really saying is less of me walking in the power of the flesh, according to the power of sin, and more of me walking in the reality and the presence and power of Christ. Galatians chapter 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. And then he says, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So it's us living either in the power of the flesh or the power of the Spirit. Now, <clears throat> Galatians here says four things, and I think the word critical is important. You know, because critical is like a fork in the road. It comes from the word cross. It's a crucial uh, factors moving in our lives and in our hearts. And there are four things about the reality of human nature. Of us, as we are born of the Spirit, and I'm talking to true Christians, born of the Spirit, and who are true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing it says is that, as Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 6, which is really one of the most important verses in that chapter. You know, we all probably know John 3, 3, you must be born again. And we all use that for evangelism or things like that. But Jesus is talking to a man who is the greatest theologian in Israel. He's the teacher of Israel, not a teacher, but the teacher. And he's talking about the reality of his nature, how he is born in Adam, and uh, that he has to be born of the Spirit. And so then he says, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is of the spirit or is spirit. Only the Holy Spirit gives birth to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of Christ within us. And so these are two categorically different kinds of people. There are three kinds of sons of in the Hebrew word is Adam, sons of Adam, meaning sons whose DNA comes from Adam. There are only two, ultimately, those who are in the flesh from Adam, and you can have any variety of that, of kind of person all over the world, ethnic groups and whatever, but if you're born in the flesh, you're in the flesh. But we must be born of the Spirit to be in the Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit within us. The second thing is that Galatians tells us the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit is against the flesh. Now, again, these are two powers, two energies. Uh, one is, you would say, a, a impersonal force, I'd call it that sin, but the other is a person, the Holy Spirit. You know, this is many times people don't understand. We think of the Holy Spirit because we use these metaphors that are neuter, you know, fire, water, uh, wind, these kind of things. Uh, and so people speak of the Holy Spirit as it. He is never called an it in, in the Spirit. He is a person. And so we are either living in and according to the power of that impersonal force of sin that's moving in us, or the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, who is the presence of Christ. And as Paul says elsewhere, the mind of Christ. This is how the Lord Jesus Christ thinks and feels and acts. So he is in us, and there are two opposite warring powers within mm -hmm. us. Now, the illustration I like is two magnets, all right? Have you ever tried to put two magnets together? What's significant is that these two magnets, when they're far apart, you don't realize how they are really opposed. All right. And see, when humanity is far away from God, it doesn't realize how far away from God it is. But the closer you come to the reality of that other magnet, say us or the other magnet, they conflict. And they are, it is impossible to put them together unless you have another power outside. But even that, if it's outside, it's not inside. All right. And so they were by nature opposed to each other and what is often the case is that many people think they're opposite you know negative and positive that's not true they're the same pole that is opposed to each other and by analogy that same pole is for rule in our hearts and i i like the old uh four spiritual laws you remember maybe some of you have seen that that genius of it is, you know, here's a circle, here's you, and there's a little throne in the center. 
that's you. And either Christ is on the throne or you're, as, it, as uh, it says there, self or the power of sin. But these are at war against each other. Now, the third thing, the flesh and the spirit operate, work, and manifest in desires. Now, this is one of the most important things about technically what is called the nature of humanity, anth anthropology. Okay, how do you work? How do you function? How do you make choices? Most people have no idea really of this fundamental reality. Every one of us are created by God to make choices according to our desires. All right, we either choose to live according to the desires of the flesh or we choose to live according to the desires of the spirit. Now there is again, what is in us, our own, what you would say common. These are not necessarily unclean or clean, but if we're living in the spirit, those choices will always be in and of the spirit. Now, <clears throat> all of us are absolutely making choices all the time. There, there are certain things within us that we're not consciously aware of, your heartbeat or you know these kind of functions, You know most of what's in your brain. But every one of us is making choices all the time. And you make the choice of that which is the strongest desire in that particular instance, whether you are aware of it or not. Now, all of us came in here this room, all right? You made a choice, walk through there. Maybe you weren't even thinking, here's a door, I'm gonna go through it. You're making a choice because you want to. You come and you sit down. Why did you sit in the seat you're sitting in? Well, there could be conscious reasons, you know, because it was the only seat that was open, you know? I like sitting on this side. I don't like sitting on that side. You know, I prefer being in the back. I don't prefer being, you know, those are all things, but you made the choice of what you wanted to do. Now, even when people are compelled to do something, you know, you can take a gun to somebody and say, you know, uh, like, oh, I don't know how, remember old Jack Benny? Some, this is a long time ago, but he talked about how the guy came up to him and says, your money or your life. Jack Benny's going, I'm thinking about it. But if you are compelled outwardly by some force, you still do what you want to do, do. All right. People die for the Lord Jesus Christ because they would rather choose to live for Christ. They desire to live and to die for Jesus rather than just to save their life. So every moment we're choosing, you know, you got up today. Why did you put on the clothes you wanted? Well, there might be reasons. You might not even care what you look like. Or there were real important reasons. I don't know, probably, I'm I, I, getting into deep water, but probably most women got in front of the mirror and said, what do I look like, you know? And because you desire to look good. And so that was functioning within you. And so that's how the Holy Spirit works in us with desires and how the flesh works. And the more, and this is, I don't say this here, but in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can assess, make the judgment, make the discernment, assess and evaluate to know what is of God or what is of the flesh or just whatever. And so the more we grow in Christ, the more we will apprehend and be, be aware of those things going on within us. Now, also, these things, Things can be from outside, influences. The Bible talks about the world or the devil, all right? But those are simply outside forces. And when we live according to what the devil says, we do it because we want to do it. It's us choosing. You know, like that old uh, comedian who say, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. You remember that one? Anyway, well, no, he didn't. The devil didn't make you do it. The devil tempted you, but you chose to do it. Some people, just one other thing, will say, you know, have a consequence. They will do something, and then often they feel deep remorse, and they'll say, I never meant to do that. Well, see, that's really not a true statement. Okay, you meant to do that, but you didn't probably want the consequences of that choice. You regret what that choice caused to happen, the pain, the sorrow. And so if you say, I never meant to do that, but you really say, I never meant to cause the pain or whatever that's in this, but you meant to make that choice because we all choose to do what we want to do. 
Now, <clears throat> the fourth thing uh, it says is being born of the Spirit, we are to choose, and this is Paul's word, to walk. To walk, which means to live in, by, and according to the holy desires of the Holy Spirit, and not the unholy desires of the flesh. Now, again, desires of the flesh are what I'm calling unholy. Desires of the Spirit are, are holy desires. Now, <clears throat> I think all of us are familiar with the word walk, but I, I like the old King, I mean, uh, uh, NIV, because it's old now. But anyway, you know, because it says keep in step with, you know, and when you walk with somebody, you can keep in step with them. Okay, when you hold hands with somebody, you can keep in step with them. Put your arm around them. You know, the more you're you're close to them, uh, the more you have to be in step. You know, you don't want to step on each other's feet. But the closer you get to somebody, the more you're going to be walking with them in alignment, in tune with them. And so the closer we live in the presence and the power, the mind of the Holy Spirit, the more we will be walking in and according to it. Now, how do we do that also with the reality of the desires of the flesh should come up? There's one word, death. That's what it is. We crucify, we put to death the desires of the flesh. Now, what does that mean? I don't mean that somehow it's no longer there. What it means, ultimately, Romans 6 says, we choose to realize we are dead to that. All right, this is how Romans 6 speaks about it. We are dead to sin. And so you live in that reality that I have been crucified with Christ. And so when those desires come up, we choose to not, this is what happens. Uh, you know, I remember this old movie, you know, where uh, Br'er Rabbit and he got in the Br'er Patch and Br'er Bear was there. And they got all the tar. And the more he tried to push away the tar, the more, you know, hung up and tarred he got. All right, and that's what happens with people with sin. They look at the sin, and they're looking at that going, no, I don't want that. And the more you focus on the power of the sin, you know, I don't want to do that. But you get captured by it because you're engaged with that desire that's like a fire that's going to burn in you or on you. Now, the actual way that Scripture says to overcome that is to realize your true identity. I am dead to that. All right, just think of a guy in a casket. You know, I remember another movie where this guy was dead in a casket and people came up and pushing him and sticking him. Remember Charade with, you know, Cary Grant? But anyway, sticks him with a pin to make sure the guy's dead. You know, he didn't move because he was dead. But see, when you're dead, you don't respond to that power that's outside. And so when we encounter, I'll, I'll give you a, uh, probably for men at least, more and more for women, but just think of pornography, all right? There's a desire. Maybe the enemy comes or your thought comes, and the Bible speaks of it as a fiery dart. It's a thought that goes into you. It's a flame, and it's intended to impact, uh, go into your spirit, into your mind. A flame is that desire that will come up. Now, you either look at that flame and engage in it, and you come more, more, or you go, I'm just simply dead. I'm dead to that. It no longer has dominion over me. It's not my identity. That's not who I am. And so you realize who you are, what you are in Christ, and you live in that identity, that reality. This is who I am in Christ. I'm dead to that. Uh, some of us have heard of Augustine or St. Augustine. He had a profligate life. He was actually a great celebrity, you know, a speaker, you know, somebody to be you know, on TV or whatever, an orator, and he lived a very immoral life. He came to Christ, and his life was totally changed. And one day he was walking along the road, and he encountered a woman that he used to, you know, have uh, fellowship with, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and she comes up to and says, Augustine, it's me, it's me. And Augustine said, yes, but it's not me. He was dead to that. No longer Christ lived in him. And so we are to choose to walk according to the desires, to be dead to the desires of flesh and walk according to the desires of the Spirit. Now, when we walk according to the desires of the Holy Spirit, who is operating, working, and manifesting in our hearts, we will have the holy desire to pray. Why is it? Well, the Holy Spirit is a praying spirit. 
All right, you know, we read in uh, Romans chapter eight, verse 26, for the Holy Spirit intercedes within us according to the depths of our inner being. He is a praying spirit. Uh, the Bible speaks of pouring out the spirit of prayer upon God's people. That's Zechariah 12, 10. When God intends to bring revival, he pours out the Holy Spirit to move people's hearts to pray. And so when we are living in the spirit, the more we're transformed according to the desires of the spirit, the more we will want to pray. All right. The more we will have the desire to pray. Now, this doesn't merely mean that we'll agree to pray. It's good to pray. All right. I don't think anybody here, if I took a poll, and says, do you think it's good to pray or not good? Nobody would say, oh, no, it's no good. All right. We all believe that. And, uh, you know, that it'd be good. Even uh, probably all of us would say, yes, I should pray. But agreeing is good and knowing you should and doing it are very different things. And the way that we do it is that we live in according to, and, and I'll use this word, cultivate or allow ourselves to become more and more conformed to the holy desire of prayer within us. Prayer will become a priority of our lives. And, and I think this is important. We will intentionally set apart. Now, that word is an, another word for this in uh, Hebrew is kadosh. In, uh, in Greek, it's uh, hagias. In our words, it's holy. Holy, in essence, means set apart. All right? And so that's what I mean. When we have a holy desire for God, for the presence of God, for the will of God, we will set apart the holy desires of our heart, will set apart time to God, both individually in our lives, it's intentional, and with other people. We will want to pray with other people. And so we will learn to do in this, and then I say to learn to do everything by prayer. Now, thinking about this too, it doesn't mean that you're constantly going around asking for requests. Lord, help this, help that, you know. That, because if you saw last week, prayer is many, many, many things. I think probably one of the greatest things of just being in a spirit of prayer is just praise. Praise and thanksgiving. Paul constantly say prayer with thanksgiving. And so people who are thankful who are just in the spirit of God, who are whatever it is, you know, you're thanking God, you're praising God, you're just worshiping God, you're uh, loving him. You're in the spirit of prayer. And when those occasions come for requests, then you're in the spirit uh, to pray. Now, the Bible clearly reveals that those who are filled with and live according to the desires of the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in them make prayer a priority of their lives. Now, we can see this. You look at the Lord Jesus. He was born by the power of the Holy Spirit, anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we saw last week, it was the priority of his life. Every single important event in his life was preceded by prayer. His whole life was a life of prayer. And now he is praying. He is the greatest example of, of the person of prayer. Because the apostolic church was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a praying church. And so we see these attributes, these essential characteristics of what is called the apostolic church. Uh, it says they devoted themselves. This, again, is this word intentionally set apart. You know, uh, I think it's important just to think of it like this. I got a calendar. I have time in the day. Here's things I have to do. But where is my time with God? All right. Where am I going to set that part? Now, you know, sometimes things come up and, you know, push that out. But, uh, you know, the way I speak of it, unless you're providentially hindered, which means somehow God allowed something to happen in your life, you are setting apart that time to pray, to seek God. And I think it's a very important, again, to pray with other people uh, that you set apart. If you're married, to set apart time with your spouse. But they devoted themselves to the teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, when you look and think about the culture of the early church, the apostolic church, you know, there's two major places of worship in that period of time, the temple, all right, and the home, house churches, all right? Now, the temple was what I would call the institutional worship. You know, people came in, they came out, you can roll around, you can talk, you can do everything, but the service is going on. 
All right. And this is often what happens here. You know, the service goes on and, and it's to worship of God. But people can be, okay, you know, whatever. You know, you come in, you go out, and you think that the service itself is going to somehow absolutely change your life or whatever. But if you're not engaged, if you're not really worshiping, you're not in the spirit, uh, it's not any more than Jesus spoke to thousands of people and the word of God was not effective in that. Now, the heart of the early church, and we see this in Acts chapter two, was the home. Because church, as we know it, a building that's an institutional uh, uh has a religious service, did not exist uh, in the early church until the time of Constantine. The reality of the church was in the home or home bases or groups. And often when, for example, I mentored a guy that uh, was in from Africa. And when I tell you how many churches he started, you'll probably be astonished. 85,000. Now you think like, well, did they have enough building material or whatever? That, no. They didn't, that's not the way the church functions in most Africa. There are buildings, there are places, but, you know, I heard somebody talking the other day, there wasn't a church in this certain country, but there were all these Christians who met together. Well, what they're talking about is a building. The church was there, the presence of God was there, and uh, this story comes to my mind, but I'm involved in a college, of, a ministry called the College of Prayer, where we're teaching people all over the world, and there was five people who came to a conference about five years ago from Mauritania. And if you know anything about that, that is one of the worst places for Christians on the planet. These guys had to sneak out to go to the conference, which was in Africa, to come there to be uh, uh, just taught and counter the reality of the presence of God, how to worship God, how to pray. They went back, they began to pray in their homes. What happened, and this is what happened, people next door to them would have a dream and it would be Jesus in the dream with the person in the house. They'd hear a knock on the door. They'd come up to the door and they'd answer it. And the person would say, I had this dream and you were in it. Do you know Jesus? Yes. And basically it went now their families to other families who would be in homes. These people are praying, seeking God. So it went from five to 500 people now who are just meeting and places of prayer and this is how the early church went and uh what, what happened then moving on uh number c and three because the leaders of the apostolic church were filled with the filled with and led by the holy spirit the first and foremost priority of their lives and ministry is prayer now notice what the word of god is they're having a crisis okay if you know john uh, Matt, acts chapter six you know the Hellenistic Christians are coming in, Greek speaking, and the Jewish, uh, Hebrew, or Aramaic Christians are there, and there's cultural conflict, which is always what happens. You know what happens when churches grow? More people, more problems. Anyway, and so here they're having a problem. And so the, the, the apostles deal with it, they create, which became deacons, but then they said, we have to do what our job description is. And what was it? Devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, I remember years ago when uh, I was looking at my own job description and thinking about, okay, what am I supposed to do? Of course, the top of the list was the ministry of the word. And then somewhere, and the Lord spoke to me and says, no, that's not your most important work. It's prayer. You know, I went to this uh, when we were in Mississippi, you know, we were teaching on this and a dear friend of mine, Chip Henderson, who's the pastor of the largest church in Mississippi, you know, I was speaking about this, you know, prayer is a priority of your ministry. And he goes, what, what? And he goes back to this verse and he says, that's right. And it changed his own personal prayer life. It changed the ministry of the church in many ways, because they realized that prayer was the first and most important thing. It's not the only thing, but it's the first and most important thing. Now, while true believers in Lord Jesus Christ are born of the spirit, why don't we pray? Now, what I mean by that, I mean, whatever way it, it comes in. Now, I think there's a lot of different reasons. I, I mentioned seven. Uh, the first is because people feel or think they don't know how to pray. You know, I don't know how many times I encounter people, well, I just don't know how to pray. Well, if that's the way you feel, bless you. 
because that's exactly how the, the disciples felt. They came to Jesus and said, you know, Lord, teach us to pray. That's why they were there uh, at that time. That's how we got so much teaching on prayer. Paul the Apostle, imagine this, you know, the greatest missionary who ever lived, you know, said, we don't know how to pray as we ought. Hello, are you kidding me? You know, again, it's Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit of God deep within us groans with with you know groanings too deep for words so paul himself says i don't know how to pray so what does he do then okay then i won't pray no he doesn't say that then i'll just yield to the power of the presence of the holy spirit and i'll just seek more and more to be in the spirit to pray now, as i say there the only way we're going to learn how to run in prayer is to take baby steps crawl you know, I almost put down the only way you can do that is to get out of the crib, all right? Because some people are in the crib. They have said, I can't pray, so I won't. We can't do that. We have to be those who, because the Holy Spirit is in us, want to pray and choose to pray. And it's not how eloquent you are. It's your heart, because God looks at the heart. Now, a second thing is people don't pray, and what I mean by this, with other people more so than, he, than themselves, but because of the fear of man, all right? The fear of man means to regard and care about what people think, their opinion and judgment more than what God thinks about you and please, and what is pleasing. Is there anybody in this room that isn't uh, susceptible to this? <laughs> no, that's fallen humanity. We're all aware of what people think in one way or another. We're all, to one degree or another, concerned. Now, there are certain people who could care less. Those are often far and in between. But most of us care about how people think about us in one way. And it's not necessarily wrong, all right? It's just what people, you know, if they're holy people, we want to have their encouragement. But people are afraid to pray in front of other people because, in a sense, the, the analogy I use is almost like you're, a, you're at a gymnastic prayer meeting. And, you know, you're doing the prayer. And there's the judges on the sideline going, oh, that was only a one. Or, wow, that was a ten. You know, and so you're afraid not to have at least a five. And so you don't even get on the thing to, to pray. And so, you know, we need to just simply step out in faith. And I don't know anybody here, really, when you sit down and think about it, if you see a baby walking and just baking baby steps, you're not going to go, oh, what's the matter with you, kid? You're not in the Olympics yet. You know, you're not going to do that. You're going to go, yeah, taking baby steps. Yay. You know, and this is and this is what we need to do. We should not let the fear of man, but the love and the fear of God uh, move in our hearts. Number three, we don't pray because we become discouraged when God doesn't answer our prayer. Now, we become discouraged in heart. And this is important. Now, the core meaning of discourage is the word core. <laughs> and the word core means heart. So we become disheartened. We become discouraged. It's not like, yeah, I don't have any more bravado. It's like my heart. It's like your heart has got a flat tire. You know, the air's gone out of it. You're just moving along. Why? Because we encounter disappointments. We encounter trials, discouragements that go along. And when this happens, often people find it difficult to pray. You can turn over now. Now, when this happens, guess who shows up? The devil. Uh, it's a, he's always looking for an opportunity, you know. And when he got done with Jesus, Luke says he waited for an opportunity to come back. So the devil comes along and just puts that thought in your mind. You call it whisper. And often most people aren't even knowing it's the devil. They just think the mind, their thoughts come, why should I pray? Nothing ever happens. What good is it? And then you can even get to, to the point where, well, God doesn't really care. Or even God doesn't love me. Now, this was something that Jesus encountered, you know, not only rallied, but realized the temptation of it. So in Luke chapter 18, he told the parable, and Luke, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, he told this parable on purpose. He says, they ought to pray at all times and not lose heart. Now, here's his caring, loving concern that he knows where we're at. He knows our infirmities. And so he goes on in this place to talk about par a parable 
probably all of us have read it in one way or another, but it's the widow who is absolutely without any influence of the culture, comes to this judge who probably in that city or culture is, you know, the most powerful person who doesn't care about God, who could care less about people. She keeps coming to him, and the word is literally bother. And he says, I could care less about God or people, but this widow keeps bothering me. I'm going to finally give her what she wants. Now, Jesus said, this is the way we ought to be with God. I think of it as bother the father. I mean, how many people go, well, I don't want to bother God. Well, Jesus wants you to. The father wants us to bother God, to keep it up, to keep praying and not to lose heart. Now, four. Spiritual decline, whereas when we become discouraged, we have difficulty praying. When we are in spiritual decline, we don't pray very much. Now, it's not like you never pray, you know, you're in an auto accident, help! Okay, something like that. But people don't pray very much. And it's what Jesus said about the parable of the sower, that weeds and the desires for other things come in and choke out the desire for prayer. When revival comes, God's people pray. Psalm 80, revive us and we will call upon your name. And this is why we must have revival. Because people are in spiritual decline. They're in spiritual decline and really the greatest evidence is how little prayer is being done in their lives as well as in the church. Uh, together, the fire has basically gone out. And so the fire of the reviving presence of the Holy Spirit must come into their lives. Now, number five, because of unbelief. People don't pray because of unbelief. Now, whereas when you're discouraged, you don't pray much. You know, when you are spiritually decline, you pray little. When you have unbelief, you don't pray at all. Now, I think theologically, the root sin of the human heart is not pride. That's the result. The root sin is unbelief. Sin separates us from God. That sin that separates us from God was that we stopped believing what God said, did God say, and started believing the devil. When we know the truth and believe God, you're not going to have pride, all right? You know you're going to be humble before God. You know you're going to be in absolute desperation. It's when we no longer believe in the truth about God that then pride arises in our hearts. Atheists don't pray. Why? There isn't a God to pray to, all right? And this is important. And it's not just a God. It is the personal being of God. Now, the reason I emphasize that is because this, because people meditate, all right? Meditation is not prayer, okay? The simple outward illustration. Now, I'm not saying not to meditate on the word of God. Okay, that's a different thing. Meditation on the word, which you think about the word. Of God. I'm just talking about what is an Eastern influence. Now, what is the biblical posture of prayer? There's being on your knees. You can stand up, and, as Paul says in Timothy, uh, lifting up holy hands in prayer. Okay, you're in need, but you also receive. Receive from God. What is the posture of people who meditate? Ever see the posture of the yoga thing, you got circles in your hand. You're thinking about centering yourself. You're in yourself. You're trying to get in tune, not with God, but with whatever force or power it is either in you. And so it's all internalized. It's not external in relationship to God. And so this is why people meditate. They don't pray because they don't have a real personal relationship with God or they don't believe it. Number six. We don't pray because of the reality of spiritual warfare. Now, again, this is what is so critical. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, we don't fight war against flesh and blood, human beings. We afford, uh, fight against powers, which many Christians in the Western world have little understanding of. But it's a real world where there's powers uh, which are ruling spirits over territories, authorities, going down the hierarchy. And so the powers of the enemy are opposed to God. And so Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. If you ever studied that, you know, it's, you know, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, these things, these are all in one way or another about Christ and attributes of Christ. But then in verse 18, he says, he says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer, supplication to the end, keep alert 
with all perseverance. Now, I find it very significant that Paul doesn't identify prayer with a piece of armor. There's truth, righteousness, salvation, the gospel, shield of faith, sword of the spirit. Okay? He doesn't say prayer is a piece of the armor because I believe prayer is the battlefield. That's where the battle is actually being fought and won. And that's why Daniel uh, was so, uh, excuse me, why, why uh, uh, the Bible says that we need to be aware of, of the power of the enemy who's waging war against us. Often we may think about prayer, we may have an intention of prayer, but then somewhere along the line, it feels like, well, I just don't feel like praying. I mean, that happens to me all the time. Okay, and I think like, okay, I can either go that way, but I often realize, you know, that's just the enemy coming on the outside of me saying, well, you don't really want to pray. All right, so the last thing is probably more uh, in evangelical Christians as much as anything as well. We rely on ourselves, on our thinking plans and programs. All right, and you guys probably remember that movie with Kevin Costner, you know, Feel the Dreams. And you got the vision, if you build it, they will come, all right? And so the, whatever it was, the divine thing or whatever it was in the universe, it told him this revelation, he built it, and all of a sudden all these ghosts from the past come. You know, it's really not very Christian, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> you know, people say, good, yay, that feel good, but it really isn't Christian. All right. Well, the key thing was, if you build it, they will come. And this is the way many Christians think. If we have the right program, if we have the right plans, if we think about how to do it, okay, this is it. Now, I'm not saying don't have program, not having plans any more than you can put wine without a wineskin. But just having a wineskin does not have wine. You got to have wine in the wineskin, all right? And you have a program or something, but prayer is the means of God's power being released in those plans, in those programs. And it's prayer that is essential. And when you look at people at churches, they got all their programs and everything, but ask how much is prayer being specifically devoted for this particular thing that we are trusting God is God's will for his power to be released. People intentionally coming together and asking God, this is what Jesus did. He would pray. This is what the early church did. This is why they had to devote themselves to pray, to fulfill the plan, the purpose of God to re evangelize the world. They devoted themselves to prayer because prayer is the means by which God accomplishes his will, fulfills his purpose, and releases his power. And so the more that we pray intentionally with other people for God's will to be done, the more we will see it happen. Now, briefly, real quick, the Bible is filled with and I, it's permeated, it's just saturated with statements about prayer. Devote yourself to pray, praying in the Spirit. Uh, you can see all those verses. So last thing I want to I want to say is just quote Daniel here, Daniel chapter nine. Now many of us I think have read Daniel, and some of us are probably even involved in studies of it. But in chapter nine, Daniel is in Babylon. You know that's the temple has been destroyed, people have been exiled. He's there, and he's reading his Bible. All right. He reads in Jeremiah, which is the word of the Lord. And Jeremiah, through the word of the Lord, said, in 70 years, I'm going to restore Jerusalem. All right. The temple. And so what does Daniel do? Does he go, well, there's the word of God. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's going to happen. No. It says that he says this. Then I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and when pleas for mercy with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. He says, this is the will of God. This is the purpose of God, and I'm going to devote myself to pray so that it will come about in world history. Again, last week, remember what I said, prayer is like the birth pangs to give birth to what's impregnated in your heart or the will of God to come about. Prayer was the means, because Daniel understood this, that God brings about his ordained, predestined, whatever word you want to use, what God determines to do. He brings it forth in answer to prayer. And so this is what we are to do to devote ourselves to prayer. Now, real quick, a question, an observation, anything? Oh, well, good. Okay, thanks for the comments, but I mean, <laughs> any other 
Uh, thank you. Anyway, uh, any any questions about what I just said? Okay. Bill. Bob. Just real quick. I just have a word of encouragement to this group. Uh, I have been guilty of being late many times for the study. And today I was distracted for 15 minutes more than well. That's just a matter of education. So you have to start with doing yeah. goes out across the town. Circumstances have made me late, but I've been a hundred lately because the words of what's being taught, I don't know. To me, this is what the gym is living from the year. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. And one other, we got you got a question here. You had real quick. No. Okay. Then I'm going to ask, let's close. What I'd like you to do is just close your eyes and Hold your hands out to God and pray. You can pray out loud or pray in your inner self. But just say, Father, I love you. And I desire for your will to be done in my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and teach me to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. God bless you. <laughs> Oh, good. It's going to say in the army. Yeah. No. Yeah.